In December 1943, at Tehran, Persia, the date for the liberation of the people of Europe was set on the Allied calendar of operations. Chosen to be supreme commander was General Dwight D. Eisenhower. Destroy Hitler's empire, smash it by air, break it wide open, then invade by sea. That was the directive. The cross-channel assault was the crux of our plan. Early capture of a large port was of the utmost importance. Considered were Calais, Dieppe, Le Havre, Cherbourg, Brest. Cherbourg was selected. For more than one full year, there poured into Great Britain a torrent of war implements, tanks, guns, weapons beyond description. And men, American soldiers, at the rate of 150,000 every month. Assault training included every phase of the coming battle. In the early spring of 1944, joint maneuvers of the ground, sea, and air forces, which were to make the attack, were held along the southern coast of England. Every duty was performed as if this were the real thing. British shores, chosen for their similarity to the coastlines of the Normandy Peninsula, were the staging areas for these maneuvers. Meanwhile, the Allied strategic air assault on Fortress Europe went on with ever-mounting power. Day and night, the Allied air forces sent their bomb cargoes into the vitals of Hitler's self-proclaimed kingdom. Targets, factories, airdromes, synthetic fuel plants, crude oil refineries, munitions works, railroads, canals, power plants. The climax of the air war came in February 1944 when the Luftwaffe made a desperate all-out effort to sweep our day bombers from the sky. The battle raged for a week. The cost to us was high, but the German Air Force came out of the battle crippled beyond redemption. Our attacks continued with unabated fury. At bivouac and training areas, ground troops received their alert orders. Men and equipment started to move. 65,000 men and 7,600 vehicles from bivouac areas all over Great Britain were moved to marshalling areas in southern England without a hitch. Highways were kept clear of all civilian traffic during this period. Rumor that the great invasion was at last underway flew through the length and breadth of Great Britain. In the marshalling area, each man drew a new gas mask of the latest type, an instantaneous life belt. Field rations were issued, including cigarettes and candy. When the men received French folding money, they knew what was what. Now special briefing officers took over. Each unit was briefed individually. The movement of the initial invasion task force from the marshalling areas to the embarkation points in southeastern England began on 30 May 1944. The timetable called for all troops, vehicles and supplies to be aboard their transports within five days. This transportation and embarkation schedule, so vital to the whole invasion plan, required the closest possible coordination of times of departure and arrival. The operation was executed with expert skill and efficiency. Morale was high. Toughened, skilled, easy under discipline. Our men knew they were ready. Embarkation of men and equipment took place simultaneously at nine seaports along the southern and southwestern coast of England. All vehicles and tanks were loaded backwards on LSDs and LCIs. Concrete and cobblestone embarkation lanes known as hards had been constructed to speed loading. All vehicles embarked with gas tanks filled and sufficient extra gas for 150 miles and the foot soldier was on time and in place.
All English seashore towns through which our military forces passed were quarantined as a precaution against the leakage of information. Had the Luftwaffe commanded the skies at this juncture, it could have inflicted great damage to our men and ships, concentrated as they were in this relatively small area. Each man carried one K and one D ration. No extra clothing or barracks bags on this trip. General Eisenhower said of these men, there is no question at all as to the readiness of the troops. They are well trained, fit, and impatient to get the job started and completed. These small assault boats ran a continuous shuttle service from the hards and docks to the transports lying at anchor in the harbor. This shuttling was a necessary expedient because of the huge amount of men and equipment that had to be loaded in a four-day period and the limited dock facilities available in the ports of southeast England. But every factor in this vast transportation problem had been envisaged and worked out in advance. The arithmetic of logistics, however, could not have clicked without the spirit of frictionless teamwork which prevailed among the staffs and men of the Army and Navy. The job was everybody's job, Army, Navy, Air Force. As each ship was completely loaded with its men and equipment, it pulled out into the harbor to take its place in the forming convoy. Aboard ship, the men sweated out the hours of waiting, each in his own way. Naval gun crews received individual briefings. The success of this tremendous undertaking depended vitally upon the naval bombardment that would precede the assault of ground forces. Troop units rehearsed their objectives from D-Day to D plus three. Everything known about the enemy's defenses was thoroughly analyzed by officers and men. Preventive maintenance service of arms and equipment was highly stressed in all branches of our military forces. An important problem was how to prevent guns and equipment from becoming fouled by salt water and sand. On 4 June, with the convoys fully loaded and ready to sail, the weather forecast for D-Day caused grave concern. A last-minute conference took place aboard the Augusta. D-Day was postponed 24 hours to 6 June. Airborne troops, the men who were to spearhead the invasion, had meanwhile been assembling at command departure points. These tough fighting men who were to drop behind the enemy's coastal defenses in parachutes and gliders had the extremely critical mission of preventing enemy counterattacks from upsetting the plan of our main assault forces. These airborne troops would be fighting the enemy and destroying his lines of communication five hours before the main assault forces hit the beaches. Covered by watchful air fighters, the American units left their various harbors in southeastern England to meet the British units at a rendezvous off the Isle of Wight. Our strategic air bombardment never let up. Through endless attacks on key bridges and rail centers, the ability of the enemy to shift reserves was fatally restricted. Under complete radio silence, each ship took its proper place in the vast armada. At twilight came the signal for the dash across the channel. At command departure points, gliders and their tow planes were standing ready for the night's operation. Speeds and altitudes were assigned to tow plane pilots and glider pilots were given a final briefing on all that was known to our intelligence regarding the conditions likely to be found in the drop zones. Each unit's mission was clearly defined. Earlier in the day, General Gavin had a final talk with his men. General Eisenhower paid a visit to the airborne infantry. These men were assigned to six Pathfinder units. Takeoff, 2310 hours of D-1. 
Time for the airborne spearhead to get going. At more than a dozen fields, paratroopers filed out of hangars on schedule and marched to their planes. Each combat team carried adequate equipment to complete its mission independently, for it was recognized that a night drop into heavily defended enemy territory by such large forces was bound to create a wild state of confusion on both sides. Parapacks of heavy equipment would be released separately. Gliders were loaded with equipment first. Each pilot checked his list of passengers. Paratroopers put on their full load of equipment, adjusting each item with extreme care. To hit the dirt just right with a full load of equipment is a highly specialized business. Final check by the jump master, the most particular man in the outfit. Paratroopers board their planes. Leg packs containing demolition supplies will be released by the men while in midair. Thus, each man will hit the dirt close to his pack. The success of the mission depended upon the rapid destruction of certain key enemy installations. The gliders take off. The heavily armed men in them, a short while before, had listened to a message from the Supreme Commander. You are about to embark on a great crusade. The eyes of the world are upon you, and the hopes and prayers of all liberty-loving people. The vast convoy of seaborne assault forces stood deployed against 50 miles of French coastline. American forces were commanded by Lieutenant General Bradley. British and Canadian forces were under command of Lieutenant General Dempsey. Shattering the dawn 90 minutes before H hour, the naval bombardment opened up. It was like a convulsion of nature. More shell tonnage was expended in one hour than in the entire Allied naval campaigns of World War I. Each warship had its assigned targets, its individual schedule of fire. Prime targets were the enemy's powerful coastal guns. Infantry units that would comprise the second assault wave began transferring into their assault boats. The first assault wave was already standing by, waiting for the signal to dash inshore. The last phase of air bombardment began at 0530, one hour before touchdown to the ground troops. Streams of heavy, medium, light, and fighter bombers crossed the channel in the most intensive airstrike of the entire assault operation. Objective, to isolate the battle area until we could consolidate our beachheads and begin the breakthrough. The big guns poured it on. Combat teams, each on a schedule, continued their unloading into assault boats. There would be little time between the first assault wave and the second. Now the rocket ships opened up, smashing at underwater obstacles and coastal mines, over the heads of the first wave of assault troops firing their massed salvos with close precision until the troops were 300 yards from the beaches. The fury from the air went on and on. Our airmen in tactical support of the ground forces took no rest that day. Back from one sortie, they gassed up, loaded their bombs and ammunition belts and grimly went out again and again. raised their sights as the assault boats went in and smashed at the enemy's gun batteries farther inland. Yet so ingeniously fortified was this coastal zone that despite the deluge of bombs and shells from our air and sea bombardment, 
Enemy counterfire was still effective as our men neared the beaches. Our first assault wave had a full share of heartbreaking misadventures. Many of their boats were hung up and wrecked on steel hedgehogs. Plunging fire from enemy batteries was extremely accurate. In the confusion, boats went astray or got out of control and crashed into one another. Forced to jump out of sinking boats, many men had to discard their weapons and equipment to save themselves from drowning. Casualties in the first hour were heavy. The British fired at fortified houses as they came in, smashing many a sniper's nest and observation post. In one American sector, fire from enemy pillboxes kept many of our men pinned against the shore cliffs. Our casualties were high. In the British sector, special duty engineers hit the beach first, with the medics and infantry following. Had secure, the infantrymen lost no time in driving on to other objectives. The second assault wave came in. In one American sector, enemy resistance was only sporadic and was quickly silenced. Our forces made substantial penetrations in the first hours. So it went on the beaches of Normandy this fateful day in June. Reinforcements continued to pour ashore. Artillery and heavy engineering equipment were firmly established. The German boast that an invading force could not remain ashore for nine hours had been flung back on the now desperate defenders. Hitler's fortress had been cracked. The great gamble had been won, having accomplished what many European military leaders believed never could be done, a cross-channel invasion. The Allies were now in position to apply their great power to the methodical destruction of the German armed might, to bring retribution to the fiendish criminals that had conceived it, to scourge it and them from the face of the earth. Airborne infantry file into buses for their last landborne ride until D-Day. until they climb aboard the airplanes and gliders. New equipment is issued. few moments to read letters from home and write a few lines but this is business and you want to be sure you're in business when the time comes so you take inventory of your stock and trade and keep everything clean and shining and ready invasion money revealed the objective by now the high command insisted that individuals should know their destination
troop carrier and airborne have their final inspection. dozen fields, paratroopers march their ships. pilot has been furnished a list of his passengers. Parapacks are checked. This outfit has enough of Pash blood in its collective veins to justify their haircut. There is a message from the Supreme Commander. You are about to embark on a great crusade. The eyes of the world are upon you, and the hopes and prayers of all liberty-loving people go with you. Pilot and crew chief make a final check of the parapax. And here's another final check. This time by the jump master just before the men go aboard.
This trooper will drop his British leg pack loaded with demolition supplies just before he lands. find the teams board the ships that will show the way into enemy territory. Nine hundred twenty-five troop-laden aircraft will home tonight on navigation aids set up by these pathfinders. This is one minute out of one hour in one day in the world's history that has rarely been equaled. These are the first ships to take off in the airborne invasion of Fortress Europe. The first Pathfinder ship is airborne at 2154. As the Pathfinders head for the coast of France, other C-47s move into position for their takeoff at the head of the runway. Thirty minutes after the Pathfinders take off, the first serials of C-47s follow on the invasion path. Greatest news story in 1944, D-Day, H-Hour. That fateful moment for which the whole world held its breath. But in the night hours of D-Day minus one, long before these first assault boats nosed onto the beach, American fighting men, troop carriers, paratroops, airborne infantry and glidermen were already there. This picture is a small tribute to those men, living and dead, who went in before H-Hour on D-Day five hours ahead of the main force to start the destruction of Fortress Europe. Their story begins in a village in England. Not the kind of village that you ever saw or read about, but a strange, unsightly place. One that had sprung up almost overnight and was known to its citizens as Shantytown. Its buildings were fashioned entirely from heavy boxes and shipping crates used in transporting thousands of gliders from the United States. It was a growing community. Every time a glider moved out of its crate, there were impatient tenants waiting to move in and set up housekeeping. Or perhaps a business establishment. And everyone in town was there for one purpose, for the day when they would join forces with the British to make the big jump. The jump that would carry them not only across the English Channel, but across an almost solid wall of steel and iron and guns and ruthless, determined men trained for generations in the art of death and destruction. But impregnable as these defenses appeared, we had a plan to surmount them. The wall of fortifications stretched along the entire coast of Europe. Part of the plan called for our air forces to carry an army of paratroops and airborne infantry over this wall. The chiefs of staff wanted them dropped deep in German-held territory to establish defense areas and block the movement of the enemy reserves. Then they decided the invasion spearhead was to strike in Normandy. Immediately, troops began to be dispatched to special takeoff points all over England, where they would stand by until the final word was given. Heroes in the making rode the highways of England that day. Busloads of them. As to how they felt, riding into their first real battle. Well, we'll let one of them tell you. It was just another ride at first, taking us somewhere for another training hop, maybe. 
After 18 months of training, you get so you don't expect anything else. At least that's the way we paratroops figured, and I, I guess the glider guys felt pretty much the same. But we found out different. They took us to a sealed airport where nobody was allowed in and none of us allowed out. This didn't bother the hot lick swingsters. We kept in shape with regular exercises and then maybe a game or two. We knew there was something cooking now, something big. And we spent any spare time we could find in reading letters from home or, or maybe writing one to the folks in that special girl. Invasion markings painted on every ship and glider brought the whole thing even closer to us. We'd soon be on our way. Money was passed out. The kind you can spend in France. They hadn't forgotten a thing we'd need. Neither had we. But when these were taken care of, not many of us forgot that for our kind of guys, knives and guns aren't enough. nearly tore his pants stepping over the barbed wire, but he didn't care. He wanted to talk to us. Ike had a lot of questions to ask. What's your name, soldier, he says. Where's your hometown? Who's the toughest man in the outfit? We told him we'd give him the answer to that last one when we got back. He inspected a few of the boys who really have to be tough, the Pathfinders. They go in ahead of all of us and plant signal markers so we can find a way. They live on a steady diet of danger. When I got through with this, we were all keyed up, raring to go. And then it was time. Most of these men had never seen real combat, but remember them. Look at their faces. They've seen plenty of action since. They're the boys of the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions. The men who faced von Rundstedt in Belgium. Stopped them cold at Bastogne and Stavolo. parachutes and I remember one little guy saying he wasn't worried none about him opening because the company that made him was in his hometown and his mother worked there in final inspection. A few of the outfits got the idea they ought to show the Germans we had Indians in America. Here they are. Indians from the Loop, from Back Bay and the Bronx. Climbing into the ship, some of us were loaded so heavy that we had to be shoved on board by the others or we'd have never made it. The loading went on into the night. places and ready long before takeoff time. Then we heard the roar of engines as the Pathfinder ships began hopping off. We knew we'd be following soon after. That takeoff was something I'll never forget. Sure, we'd all made a lot of training hops, but this was different. Like the first time you ride a bicycle, only with a whole lot farther to fall if anything goes wrong. Nothing did, though. Not with those troop carrier guys at the controls. Talk about making trains run on time. You could have really set your watch by the split second way those guys took us off. They took those ships off the ground like it was just another practice run. For them, I guess it was. After all, they were going to have to fly it again and again, all night and the next day. 
only under fire. And that's no fun when you figure that these C-47s haven't any armor, no guns, and have to fly low over the dropping zones, straight as on a bombing run. After we hit the channel and started to cross, every light went out. We had no idea where we were when we got the order to stand up and hook up. That came so quick we didn't have time to do much thinking before we were over the side and starting that 400 foot drop into France. Thousands of us. really had their hands full bringing those babies down in the dark that way. There were darn few signal lights to help them find their way. The Germans had caught a gun with crossfire almost from the minute they'd set down. They had to do their work lying flat on the ground. But those gliders got down. And the troops and guns inside them got into the fight. The pilots fighting right along with them. I guess we did plenty of damage that night. Yes, they did plenty of damage. Blocking road junctions, knocking out bridges, capturing fields for airstrips, and all the while, out in the channel behind them. Navy guns kept slamming away at the beaches, softening things up for the big push that would begin at dawn, clearing the way for the biggest invasion in history, the greatest movement of men and supplies. Troop Carrier Command was ready for its next move. They had massed hundreds of British and American gliders in preparation for the most gigantic aerial towing job ever attempted. Each held a full cargo of jeeps and guns and the fighting men to use them. The and success of those who were already in France depended on the flight of this vast armada. They were greatly outnumbered and desperately needed these reinforcements. How they got them, a story of two-way air traffic and an unbroken chain of planes and gliders stretching from England to France and back again, is best told by a man who was a part of it all. Maybe we glider pilots didn't show it. But we were as excited over flying across that English Channel as Blario must have been when he flew it for the first time, years before most of us were born. He didn't have much of an airplane under him, but then there weren't any German guns waiting for him on the other side. We did a bit of wondering about those guns as we started out over the Channel and the lighthouses of England began slipping away beneath us. And what about the German Luftwaffe? This was its big chance. Our air forces had established air supremacy, sure. We had a regular umbrella of fighters over us. But if there was ever a time that German flyers would try anything to break through, this was that time. But we never saw a German plane. Approaching the French coast, the ak, -Ak and gunfire seemed harmless and far away. For those who were right in it, it was different. It gave us a feeling of pride to be a part of it all, looking down at those men on the beaches of Normandy. We felt a little guilty, too, sitting up over them, not even getting our feet wet. The Germans flooded entire areas to slow us up if a beachhead was established. We kept watching for those who had gone in during the night, but we only saw their parachutes. There was no sign of them. first glider. We'd find out pretty soon what had happened. Cut loose. 
Roger. So long. We stretched our glides as much as possible. That way, we ended up near the edge of the fields where we could run for cover as soon as we got out. Not everybody came down exactly where they wanted to. One glider went right into a German field headquarters. And what was that I said about not getting our feet wet? This bunch was lucky. The Germans were under control in this section. But more than one tow ship and glider made its last flight that day. Guns didn't do all the damage. 15-foot poles driven into the ground ripped off wings and smashed through fuselages. The men who stepped out of this glider will never know if their first mission was successful. But it was plenty. Yes, their mission had been successful. But this down payment on freedom ran very high. These broken wings served the highest purpose. They carried an army into Normandy. An army which spearheaded the Allied invasion, carried the fight for freedom right to the front door of those who had challenged it. A ring of steel and iron and guns and determined free men was closing in. Months and miles of battle lay ahead, but D-Day minus one was the beginning. Okay, troop carrier, where do we go from here? In England, General Dwight D. Eisenhower and his deputy commanders chart the liberation of a lost continent. Plan when and where the mighty armies of the United Nations will strike. Today, northern France is that battleground. Into the building of their defense system, the so-called West Wall, the Nazis poured the slave labor of conquered nations. Pictures made by the Germans themselves to impress their satellites with the strength and invincibility of their fortifications. steel and concrete emplacements four years in the making, the Germans have amassed every known weapon of defense. Whether those weapons are enough to stop the Allied onslaught will be proven in the struggle that lies ahead. side of the channel, Britain, and armed camp bristling with tanks and trucks and guns from the United States and Canada. Here is the fruition of four years of planning and production. Here is a glimpse of England as the Allied armies awaited D-Day. Locomotives built to run on continental railways. Freight cars and tank cars to replace rolling stock destroyed by the Germans. All this and more is included in the gigantic preparation for invasion. Here is something of the gigantic naval armada assembled to transport the Allied armies across the English Channel. Here is something of the ingenuity of Allied engineers. Assault boats and invasion barges launched directly from the decks of the ships that brought them to England. Week after week, the fleet grew in numbers. 
steel ships of every description, ships expressly designed and constructed for the mission upon which soon they were to embark. Nothing was left to chance. Every loading operation was rehearsed and timed in advance. Every soldier knew his station. Every man knew just where he was to fit into the gigantic pattern. Daily they boarded their ships. For all they knew, they were bound for France or Belgium or wherever their commanders had decided to strike. Every jeep, every tank, every piece of mobile equipment was assigned its place in the grand strategy of attack. Then on the fifth day of June, 1944, just as you see them here, a fleet of more than 4,000 ships put out from England. This was D-Day, fourth anniversary of the Battle of Dunkirk, and the Allied armies were striking back. The great fleet was underway. This was the battleground, fierce fighting around Cannes. Vast squadrons of bombers and transports led the way, more than 11,000 planes spearheading the attack. Paratroopers landed in Normandy behind the coastal defenses, landings made with timing and precision perfected only through scores of rehearsals like this. Barges approach shore ready for instant action. Some bearing artillery and rocket guns already opening fire. Just as in these scenes, the armies of the United Nations have made their first landings on the soil of Western Europe. Another of the great decisive battles of world history has been joined. This is the day for which free people long have waited. This is D-Day.
on June the 6th, 1944, an Allied expeditionary force will invade the continent of Europe. That day must come. January of 1943, the Allies commit themselves to the liberation of Europe, while their soldiers, sailors, and airmen storm the gates of Tripoli. North Africa is yet to be won, but the combined chiefs of staff speak their distant dream to cross the channel, return to the continent. The chiefs of state christen the supreme operation with a noble code name, Overlord. In London, a year later, the Supreme Commander Allied Expeditionary Forces, General Eisenhower, takes up the task of piercing the heart of Germany and destroying her armed forces. But across the narrow English Channel lies the ultimate barrier, Hitler's Atlantic Wall, formidable guardian of Festung Europa, the fortress of Europe. Marshal Rommel, the Desert Fox, one-time hero of the Africa Corps, commands the coastal defense. He multiplies the fortifications and sows death on the beaches for those who dare transgress. But there is no roof on the fortress of Europe, and assault from the sky begins long months before the day called deed. This is the key that unlocks the gate. Paralyze Germany's war machine. Pound the Luftwaffe into impotence. troops, the men who must finish what the bombers have begun. Each month, the United States pours 150,000 of her young men onto the British Isles. All England becomes an armed camp, one vast depot of armament and supplies. torrent of material and men will be set in motion, southward to the channel, southward to the embarkation ports, southward to destiny.
It is spring, 1944. The date has been set. The hour has been chosen. Men committed to the assault are sealed in ships for secrecy. Ports, camps, and assembly points are cut off from the outside world. There is nothing to do but wait on tide and weather. Wait and get ready and keep ready. And wait and wait. ships depart. From different ports, the ships sail at varying intervals to arrive at the five landing beaches together. Five beaches stretched 60 miles over the coast of France. the landings. Intelligence officers have warned the Supreme Commander that the airborne assault is too hazardous to succeed. But without it, the landings may fail. Eisenhower faces a crucial decision. Should he risk the slaughter of two superb divisions, or should he cancel the drop and imperil the whole invasion? He orders the paratroopers to France. Channel. 
the vanguard of 35 divisions moves unmolested toward the beaches. Warships prepare to open the assault with a barrage of gunfire. Battleship Nevada is there, torpedoed at Pearl Harbor, a flagship at Normandy. Naval guns open the Western Front. Inside Hitler's Atlantic Wall, the Nazis know what the world does not. The assault is on. Defeated in the North. Defeated in the South. Defeated in the East. The Germans have but one hope left. Destroy the invaders from the West. secret purpose. Huge, hollow blocks of cement that will be sunk offshore, forming piers. Few things are predictable in war. Sometimes casualties are lightest, where heaviest losses are expected. And often the worst fighting takes place, where none is anticipated. But whichever way the battle turns, each man must face his ordeal alone.
54 merchant ships are deliberately sunk to build a breakwater that shelters the shore under its lee. Together with the mulberry units, they form a man-made harbor. Tons of supplies pour in with the invading troops, not afterwards when it might be too late. Human ingenuity rises to the challenge of invasion. But one factor, one all-important factor, remains beyond human control. of the German army, navy, and air force is unable to do. The worst channel storm in 80 years almost does. But the invaders hold the beaches. And in the ports of England, wave after wave is mounted to build and broaden the landings. The Allied Expeditionary Naval Forces execute their mission to assure the safe and timely arrival of troops, weapons, supplies a mission which will have a profound effect on the history of man. This program will be interrupted from time to time to bring you the latest news bulletins as they are received in the newsroom. Keep tuned to your favorite NBC station to keep in step with all the latest developments on this Invasion Day. And now the orchestra opens the program with the revival of an old hit, Blue Room. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt this program to bring you a special broadcast. This is George Hicks speaking. I'm now speaking from the tower above the signal bridge of an American naval flagship. And we're lying some few miles off the coast of France, where the invasion of Europe has begun. It is now 20 minutes to 6. planes release a barrier of bombs that cut off German reinforcements, paralyze German counter moves. Every road, every bridge, every rail line, every canal, all the way back into Germany, is smashed, isolating the French beaches.
every 75 yards. A landing craft heads for the shore and touches down. Resistance is furious from German suicide squads. But the Americans go in and hang on by their guts. Dunkirk returned to France, this time to stay. The British soldiers who beat Rommel on the sands of Africa helped destroy him on the sands of Europe. view their work. Eisenhower and Admiral Ramsey, commander of Allied naval forces, commander of American naval forces, Admiral Stark, Lieutenant General Omar Bradley, commander of the first United States Army. Field Marshal Montgomery of El Alamein, commander of Allied ground forces. After invasion, the breakout. The swelling Allied armies stream inland, into Europe. Behind the survivors lie those who died to enslave the world. Those who died to free it. <laughs> 